Hi, everyone, and welcome to Life Bulb Live. Today, we have a really great conversation about something that I am extremely passionate about, and I think we're going to have a great conversation because our views are going to be quite different. Uh, it's going to be about PTSD and how to get through it with some help from your friends. Karin, we have a great guest on today, don't we? Absolutely. We've got Denise Redeker, um, heart transplant patient and leader within the transplant community. Uh, welcome, Denise. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here and talk with you guys. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to have you here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so today we're just going to talk about PTSD and how it's affected us. I know that I'm not a transplant recipient, but I've been affected deeply by PTSD through trauma and through my own illnesses. So I think that, you know, our, our society is now starting to look at PTSD in chronic illness, not just for war, you know, uh, victims of war. And I think that's really, really important. I know in the cancer community, it's even dubbed as cancer post-traumatic stress disorder because it, it's real. It's something that's really affected, it affects people. So Denise, you wrote a little blog post about it for us, didn't you? I did. I did. It took me a long time to write it because it involved a whole lot of processing of my own um, stuff that I was carrying along and figuring out how to let it go. And writing that was super therapeutic for me, turned out to be super therapeutic for me. So Denise, can you tell us a little bit more about it since not everyone has written uh, or read the blog? And we'll put it up too. Okay. Um, well, I had a heart transplant three years ago and um, that probably is enough um, for to create a little bit of medical PTSD. But um, I had a lot of complications post transplant and those complications um, created a lot of baggage for me. Um, I had to have three open heart surgeries in the span of a week because of internal bleeding. I had to relearn how to swallow um, because I had been intubated so many times. Um, I was given so many pain medications. I had to have Narcan to have it reversed so that I didn't die. Um, I had both types of rejection and an infection. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a long, slow process to recovery. And I realized that um, during that process, I picked up a lot of triggers um, from things that I think are funny that trigger me. Um, and I think, I think if we, you know, I try to look at everything with a sense of humor um, at this <laughs> point. I, and I, and I think we all, if we've been through medical stuff, um, we all have kind of a dark sense of humor at this point. <laughs> okay. So, so um, I really feel um, like applesauce is a huge trigger for me. Um, that was how they retaught me how to swallow. Um, they would tint it blue and make me swallow it while they threaded a camera up my nose and down the back of my throat to watch me swallow. Yeah, Denise, can I ask you, because I'm, I'm super interested in this. Um, yeah. I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to really understand it. So when you say a trigger, I get it because you know, it's the whole story of the Madeleine cookies, right? I mean, you 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 have a either a scent or a taste or you know an experience, and it reminds you of something. Uh, so when you say trigger, it when you have apple sauce, it it brings you back to the moment when you had to learn how to swallow. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. If I, I mean, trust me, there is no apple sauce in my house, but. <laughs> <laughs> but but if I see it or, you know, somehow it gets brought up in conversation, my first memory, my first thought is going to be a flashback to that um, particular time in my life. Um, beeping sounds yeah. are a huge one for me, mm -hmm. uh, not just clearly because everything beeps in a hospital everything beeps in a hospital. But prior to transplant, I had an implanted, um, an ICD, an implanted pacemaker and defibrillator. And when the battery would die, which happened three times, well, twice that the battery died once that I had a problem with it, um, it would beep and it would start coming from inside of me. So I would mm. hear this audible beeping noise from inside of me. Um, and that, um, to this day, if I hear a 
truck backing up, if I can't label it in my head, I will stop a conversation cold and find out where it's coming from. I need to know, I need to, I need to be able to label it and define it in my head even today. It's funny that you said applesauce because for my son, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I sat him down to tell him he had just come home from soccer practice and he was eating French fries and applesauce and he cannot eat that combination anymore. It like really brings him back to that moment when I told him. Yeah, he he used to dunk his French fries in the applesauce. I don't know, (laughs) kids. But he wrote a whole piece about it because it really affected him. And you know, you're talking about sound. I think what people don't understand is PTSD can be triggered by sound, by smell, by touch, by taste. You know, it's not just seeing something. Uh, it, it really, it really can affect people. Now, Karin, you have a completely different effect when you think about your transplant and everything well, that you you went through. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's they're different and I've been thinking about it a lot since, since you scheduled this and, and mm-hmm. talked about it because um, I want to understand. I mean, I, I'm, I'm right. really want to understand things and, and I get it. Uh, you know, I, when I was diagnosed with type one diabetes, um, I, I have, I can still smell even now in my brain, I can generate the smell of insulin. I know what insulin smells like. And it, it brings me back to that moment when I was diagnosed, which is still the absolute worst day of my life. You know, it was so traumatic. Um, for me, if I go to a hospital now, if I go into a hospital, even the transplant um, division uh, where I was, I kind of feel a sense of security. You know, so it's different. The diagnosis of diabetes was a total disruptor and very traumatic and and makes me feel really vulnerable and sick. But if I go to a hospital uh, now that is related to transplant, I kind of feel that I, I have an action plan. To me, the transplant was a path toward recovery while the diagnosis of diabetes was a path toward disease, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think about it that way. For me, when I got my kidney, when I got my pancreas, I was very sick. And uh, when I got the transplant, my whole intention, and, and I'm very focused in what I do, I'm very compartmentalized. So, you know, I just thought this will lead to a better life for me. So when I think transplant, it's a positive. Uh, when I think um, a pacemaker, which I, I, I also have, uh, it's more negative because that means that something was was wrong, that mm-hmm. they corrected it, and, and uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it um, in a way. So so it, I, I think that the, there is that, that concept of PTSD is um, uh, related to what um the event actually led to right what my intention was and i wonder if you know when you struggle with ptsd the way you both uh you know do i wonder if there's a way to retrain the system to say you know my surgery with uh breast cancer for example your surgery Anne marie which is so traumatic for a woman it's so traumatic But if you can train your brain into saying, I got rid of, you know, the cancer, and that led me to a better place. And you, you know, Denise, I got a heart. I now can do all these things. I wonder if one can retrain. Because for me, that was always the the plan. And I don't know if it's going to be the same now. Because if I need another transplant, I'm going to see it more as a failure of a transplant and a replacement, which is more complicated. And that I worry about. Yeah. But that first moment of getting rid of something that was so diseased felt like an upside. And that's the only way I can explain it. I think we can actually learn a lot from what you just said. And I agree. I think there is a way to retrain your thinking and your thought process with that. And it's so funny how you worded that because I had a girlfriend who was having major anxiety. She was di- She had breast cancer and then became stage four. And it was really traumatic for her because she already experienced it, right? So she already went through chemo and everything and she knew what she was gonna go through. And every time she sat in that chemo chair, she would say, this is going to help me. And I just got goosebumps. This is how I'm going to you know, live 
a, just a little bit longer, have a little bit of longevity. She would say that to herself as she was getting the chemo every single time because it really did help retrain her brain to think that, okay, I can get through this, I can do it. So I do, I do think there is a way to retrain your brain. I also think that triggers are really important. Denise, you know, I know like talking about applesauce and all of that, those triggers is our body's defense mechanism, right? So it, we have them so that we can defend ourselves and maybe maybe guard ourselves just a little bit because we don't want to work through it. But if we ignore the triggers constantly, they just perpetuate and the PTSD grows and grows and grows. So we do have to learn to handle those triggers and re rethink how we're handling them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's we, we put trigger warnings on so many things, yet those triggers are meant so that our body can heal a little bit too. Yeah, I actually think everybody in this in this panel is correct because i um i fully live my life in a place of gratitude my heart transplant saved my life um and i um and and i have a better life now i am i am healthy ish um you know as i because tr transplant as karen knows is a treatment it's not a cure and so you are as healthy as as you can be taking all the meds that we do to stay alive and but i'm healthy i am um you know just got back from a four and a half mile um run walk slow jog um and and um before we started this and I can do things that I never imagined that pre-transplant that I could do. So I live my life every day in a place of gratitude. Um, transplant was a game changer. And Kern's right. I see the hospital as a place where plans can be developed. And, yeah. and I had a traumatic experience there. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, in my opinion, it's not an either or. I think both are true. Right. Um, I have a fantastic medical team who I would not be here without. They are the creators of a plan for me and they saved my life more than once. Um, and there were really traumatic things that I'm super glad that I have been able to work through and writing this article was one of the reasons and ways that I was able to work through them. Um, and recognize that they're there and recognize that they're triggers. And I think that's a healthy place to be in is to say, hey, you know, I'm really affected by the sound of beeping or um, a dish of hard candy that I see because that takes me back to a treatment room or um, mint gum, a friend of mine who went through breast cancer, mint gum is a huge trigger for her because she used to chew mint gum while she was having chemo um and to to take away that metallic taste when they flush yeah. the right. flush your ID watermelon line. watermelon we, was mine, we all yes. know that and we all know that metallic salty weird icky taste that's in your mouth if i say it you all can taste it if you've had it you know when mm -hmm. they flush your flush your iv line and she used to chew mint gum. She can't chew mint gum anymore because it just takes her back to that place um that's not unhealthy i don't think um, if you, if yeah, you recognize it and deal with it, I think it's, it's whether or not you let it own you. Well, I think that's the point. Uh, you know, again, it goes back to the Madeleine cookies. I mean, this, this is not just PTSD. This is a human, you know, this is something that has existed for, for, forever, uh, with various different triggers. And, uh, I think Anne-Marie said it well. I mean, triggers, if you have an allergy and, and the way you treat an allergy is, you know, to give a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then finally maybe you can you can handle it. So it's it's interesting. Uh, you know, personally, I have great difficulties just doing a, a blood draw. Like when I go in and I have to do, and I know that they're going to be difficult, it's gonna, they're not going to find the vein, it's going to be, and I'm going to sit there and I feel literally like they're taking my life. You know, they're removing my life by withdrawing the blood. That makes me feel vulnerable. So, you know, for me, PTSD, whatever we call it, is always triggered when I feel um, like I'm not in control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the blood draw is a moment of not being in control. However, when I go in to see my physician, I feel in control because I'm speaking. So I have... I have a similar, I have a, I feel like I, I have a conversation and that's interesting. 
but but when I'm hooked up somewhere, that's also you know pretty much when you feel like you're not in control. So turning it into something that you can control is um, is maybe a, a way to deal with it. Um, and I think the apple sauce and the smell and those are more benign in a, in a way, uh, unless it triggers you back to that open heart surgery and you you feel pain, I literally feel pain or, 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 or fear. I mean, severe PTSD can cause physical pain for sure. Right. Um, and I think Denise, like everything that we're talking about is so important because we all handled it so differently. And what may work for me may not work for you. It may not work for the, our, you know another friend. That's why we have to keep talking about it. And you writing a piece about it did help you. Journaling is a great way to help with PTSD. And part of the topic here is about getting through this together. And it is so important to talk to each other about it because whether or not we find the tool to use, talking about what we went through is so critical. And Denise, I know you're one of our you know, active members on transplant life. And I, you know, because I didn't have a transplant, although I do watch the platform quite closely and I can relate to a lot of the topics. When I see you post something about anxiety or PTSD and one of our other members comes in, Alicia or Amanda or Caroline, whoever, Jean Marie, whoever it is comes in and says, oh my gosh, I know exactly how you feel. I feel that too, but blah, 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 blah. It validates what you're going through. And that really can be the pathway to, healing through PTSD. And I loved how Karin, you were talking about it being one path for one thing and one path for another, because it is so true. This journey that we're all on, for lack of better terms, has so many different roads and you never know when it's going to affect you. You don't know when that PTSD or when that anxiety could kick in. So being able to talk to it with a group of people, you know, the way Transplant Life was created in forums that are, you know, broken off into those categories is so beneficial. Yes. Transplant is an adventure. I call it an adventure. It's just, it's, you never know what, where it's going to take you and what road it's going to take you on. But I think that the key to getting through most types of PTSD, and you're right, Anne-Marie, there are, there are some severe types of medical PTSD that require way more than we're talking about here. But talking to people who can relate, talking to people who understand, um, writing it down, um, and, and, you know, choosing, choosing to um, focus on the positives, um, choosing to, to work your way through it. And I think one of the ways for me that working my way through it was, was a writing about it, but b choosing that I owned it. It didn't own me. I love that. I do. Um, and I, I've experienced PTSD where it's overcome my body, shaking, throwing up. I mean, like extreme PTSD from just, you know, feeling something that reminded me of a situation. I mean, it's it's real. And I think, like we're saying, talking about it is really what got me through it. Actually, what happened was not to go into detail of all that, because it's, it, it's a different situation, but writing a letter about it and then burning the letter. Like I couldn't write the letter to what I was, what had happened to me, but I could write a letter and let all those hard emotions out is really what got me through that. And no one read it. It was just for me. And yeah. sometimes that's, is what it's about because it's exactly what you're saying, Denise. It's not owning me. I'm letting it go. And that is a really hard thing. And again, I don't mean to keep going back to it, but having a platform where you can let it go together is so profound. I mean, I'd be lost without my different communities, truly lost without them. And, you know, I, I, I just love watching you guys connect like that on Transplant Life because this is such a traumatic experience. It does lead you to, to a path of a, of a better life. And you're right. I love that you said this isn't a cure because I think, you know, the, the population who doesn't live with a chronic illness may, may look at it kind of like a cure. And that's not what it's about. Mm hmm. Well, I don't know about that. That's interesting. I remember listening to a talk by a person uh, who uh, his 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 job or his goal was really to to say that there was no cure for diabetes and a transplant for sure was not a cure. And um, you know, I don't know. I like to think about it as a at least a, a cure of symptoms. And um, it does need to be managed. Okay. But what is a cure? You know, how do we define a cure? It's mm -hmm. always philosophical, because a cure, you know, traditionally would be a one shot with no 
um, no, uh, no maintenance, uh, no further risks, uh, you know, that's a cure. But, you know, to the individual, uh, it, a cure could be a wide range of things. And I think if for some people, they may want to think that it is a cure, at least temporarily. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's hard to, we should be careful with saying it's not a cure because to some people they may think it is a cure, they may want to believe it is a cure. Um, and even though it's temporary and maybe they, and there's obviously maintenance needed and, and, and new risks, but just thinking about that up and not having to think about your disease all the time, you know, um, and it's moving one disease for another. I get that. You know, if you have a pancreas transplant, you don't have to take insulin, but you have to take immunosuppressants. So you're moving one from another, but at least you have one win. Uh, and right, you just said something. When you live with a chronic disease, you ha don't have that many wins. So for me, I think the only way, the, the best way for me to have managed over 31 years, you know, almost 32, is uh, to take small, small steps. And every little step, I can have a little win. You know, even if I go two steps back, I have another win, even if I'm further behind than I was yesterday, but I at least moved forward. Um, but but yeah. you said something that I've never heard before, and I think I love it. It's a cure to some symptoms. And that is that is pretty big because you are right there. It, you may not be curing the whole illness, but you are curing part of the symptoms that maybe debilitate your, your, your lifestyle. And that's, that is yeah. a big win for sure. Yeah. For sure. yeah. I actually think, and, and every transplant is different. I know a couple of liver transplant recipients who um, their liver has adapted so well to their body that they don't have to take immunosuppressants anymore. For them, it really has been a cure. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a treatment anymore. Um, heart transplant recipients and lung transplant recipients, it's a little more treatment and not a cure. I think kidney, kidney transplant recipients, they tend to have a bit better recovery. I, I think every transplant looks a little different. Um, every organ looks a little different. I don't know about that. I don't, I, I, I would never want to compare one transplant to another and say that one is more serious. No, no, not at all. They're not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, everybody, everybody has their own adventure but like like i said i mean it, the potential for like a liver transplant recipient to yeah. maybe be able to get off of immunosuppressants because their liver is adapted so well that's huge that's amazing um and and that is that is something that that we would all just aspire to that would be fantastic um but um you know i i I think you're right. I, I agree with you completely about taking the little wins and and running with those little wins um, because it is it is a little win um, every time you every time you have a um, good lab report, you know, and the and the labs come back and they're great. That's a win. Um, and I I do a little happy dance when my labs come back and they're fantastic. Um, that is a huge win for me. Every time I'm able to do something that I wasn't able to do pre-transplant, that's a huge win for me. Yeah, I've, um, seen, I've seen that sentence come up a few times in transplant life. Every time I've been able to do something I couldn't do before, like that, yeah. I can get that. And you know, it isn't just about cures and surgeries and treatments. It is about those little, those little innovations, those little products, the devices, and all those things that we do find to, to better our quality of life. And that is part of what Life Bulb is about, is finding those little, you know, I don't want to call them hacks, but, you know, those things that do change things for us. Right now, next week, we are embarking on our 10 finalists for the uh, transplant challenge. And it's, I love watching those come through. Like, I truly, truly love it. Because you never know what's going to work for somebody. You just don't. And being able to bring those to the table and bring those to these different communities is pretty amazing. Karen, don't, I, I mean, that must be one of the most, your proudest moments as, you know, the Life Bulb CEO is being able to add those innovation challenges to our, our community. Innovation challenges are, are the core of Life Bulb uh, it, because it's the ultimate patient. The ultimate patient is not just a patient, it's not just an advocate, but it also is a problem solver. You know, to me, uh, we can all do you know, we can only do that much. And, uh, but those individuals who have taken it, you know, on themselves to 
uh, find a solution to a problem that they've identified and then gone with it, you know, given up so much. Any entrepreneur will say we give up a lot, but to give up so much and then go forward and 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 bring a product to market. That's amazing. And and, you know, you do it out of the passion and out of your own you know, uh, identification of the problem. So these patient entrepreneurs next week will have 11 um, and they will all be presenting their ideas or their their concepts, their, their products, their, their, in their companies. And we will have a winner and the winner will get 25,000. And uh, I think it will be remarkable. Everyone is, uh, you know, so great. And it's very difficult to, to judge because they're all so different. Uh, you know, we have um, such a degree of, uh, you know, devices, healthcare IT, consumer products. We even have an RNAi technology company. So uh, it's going to be interesting. And while we're talking about that, we cannot forget that we're in the midst of recruiting for our next innovation challenge, which is an inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's and colitis, incredibly important disease area. And right now, if you are in that space, if you have a technology, a company, an idea that you can put behind, uh, you know, an application, please do consider applying to um, our innovation challenge in IBD, which is ongoing. It's on our website. And um, uh, I think uh, it, it's going to be a great competition as well. And we, we did add the link there. And just to piggyback off of what Karin just said, if you don't have a device, but you know somebody that might share this, because Denise, you know, I say this all the time, you don't know who you know. So sharing it is really, really important because you don't realize your broad network when you are in this advocacy world. Um, I've, I've passed it along myself to uh, several yeah, people I know in the community. So yeah, I, I right there with you. I pass it along all the time. I know we're just about out of time, but, you know, this goes right with what Karin had just said about, you know, as advocates and as patients, you do take your passion and put it into something. And you did take your passion and put it into something. Can you really briefly, can you just tell me a little bit of, tell us a little bit about your foundation and oh, what yeah. you we uh, we started last year. We started Heartfelt Health Foundation, and it's a nonprofit based here in Northern California. Um, and our goal is to make sure that no heart transplant patient, and hopefully soon no solid organ transplant patient, needs to worry about where they're going to uh, find or afford their post transplant housing expenses. Uh, most people have to relocate to one of the four transplant facilities in Northern California um, for a period of time post-transplant, and that is rarely covered um, by insurance. And if they do have coverage, it's only minimal. And so we seek to help remove that burden um, from these patients so they can focus on their recovery and the amazing new life that they're going to have post-transplant and not have to worry about the potential financial devastation that comes along with it. How was that for quick? <laughs> that was that, that's like you got you got your two minute elevator spiel down to a science. Well, <laughs> as as director of communities, I'm super proud to have you as an ambassador for this amazing group of people that we have, and I love reading your posts on transplant life. I know that you put your heart right out there, for lack of better puns, there, but you definitely do, and it does make a difference to sh to share that part of yourself. So thank you so much for doing that and being part of our community, and always willing to share a post or a comment or a blog. Um, it's just a, it, I just love this community so always. much. I I love amazing. it too. It's always a safe space where you can put your heart on the table, and you know for sure nobody's going to stomp on it or make you feel less than or make you feel like your feel feelings aren't valid, even if you personally don't resonate with them. Um, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't hit your home base, nobody's going to say people are going to reply to you with love and care and, and empathy. A hundred percent of the time, it's a great forum. Right there says a lot about our community. So if you you know are a transplant recipient or a care provider, please t check out transplantlife.com where you can find Denise posting her heartfelt comments. And we're super proud to have you here. So thank you so much. Karin, do you want to add anything else? Thank you so much. Beautiful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>